everyone and welcome to my talk. I'm going to talk about migrating and breaking changes and actually I'm going to be using ESLint instead of TSLint for this one. So if you want to know why, you got to wait for the talk yeah, <laughs> and not leave yet. So my name is Tanimira. I just moved to developer advocate, switched my role at Progress. I work on a very cool project called NativeScript, which is a mobile framework for building native applications for Android and iOS. You can also use Angular with it. Uh, today I'm not going to be talking about NativeScript, but if you want to find out more about it, visit the website or ask me on Twitter. I'm also a GD for Angular. So nobody loves breaking changes, right? We're all pretty clear about that. But breaking changes doesn't have to be hard to migrate. You may have noticed, if you're using Angular, that in the past few versions, migrating has become much, much simpler compared to what it used to be. So one of the biggest reasons is the ng-update command. The ng-update command updates the package that you provided, and it also executes some migration scripts. For example, if you had to migrate when you are 8, the ng-update command would have updated your lazy loading configuration. So before you had to use some magic string syntax, and now you can use uh, the, import, the dynamic import syntax. And executing a update on your project actually automatically migrates your routing configurations. But the cool thing is that ng-update is actually quite extensible. The Angular team uses it, but you can also use it in your own libraries. So today, we're actually going to learn how to automate our code migrations. So if you have a library that you're ordering, we're going to learn how you can write a migration script that your users can use. But you can also use these skills to write different migrations. Also, we want to, deprecate, uh, to disallow using a deprecated API. We want to make sure that everyone in our organization switches to the new API and gets errors when they're trying to use some deprecated API. And finally, we're going to learn how to make an Angular library ng-updatable. More specifically, we're going to write an ESLint rule with a fixer that will uh, change the code. And then we're going to integrate this rule as a schematic inside ng-update in our library. So let's see what is the breaking change that we're going to be migrating. It is something NativeScript specific. We kind of introduced that change. So we're actually um, the ones that are responsible for this. It's pretty simple. You used to be able to import from UI search bar. And now you have to import from this package called TNS core modules and then specify UI search bar. It sounds pretty straightforward and it doesn't really take much more than a search and replace, right? But there are a few factors that compli complicate this. You can also use a regular expression, right? Doesn't sound so much. First, there are quite a lot of paths that are disallowed, disallowed now, and you have to change them. And you have to change all your imports. The second thing is that there are plenty of ways to import modules in JavaScript mainly because we didn't really have a very standard way to do modules before years 2015. Also because you're using TypeScript, but you might also want to be able to migrate JavaScript projects. And they could be using the CommonJS standards and using require. Also, you now have dynamic imports. So there are quite a lot of syntax ways to import modules. So you may be very good with regular expressions, but still, you end up with something hard to maintain and read. And finally, these call things are valid, so you don't really want to catch them with your regular expression and uh, change this code. This is why we're going to be using something else for migrating. And more specifically, we're going to be using ESLint. And naturally, you may have that question right now. Why don't we use the TypeScript linter TSLint? Well, long story short, TypeScript will be deprecated in favor of ESLint. If you want to find out why, read this blog post article by Pawantir, the software company that actually writes TSLint. The good news is that you can use ESLint to lint your TypeScript code as well. 
So ESLint is a JavaScript linter. It analyzes your code statically, so it means that it doesn't e actually execute it. And it can find problematic patterns and report problems. Under the hood, what happens in ESLint? We ha it takes your source code, it runs that through a parser. The default parser for JavaScript is called Esprit or Esprit, not sure how it's actually pronounced. And it generates a data structure called abstract syntax tree or AST. As an example, if we have this uh, import declaration, when we run it through the parser, we're going to get this data structure. Um, the first, the root node is an import, is of type import declaration. The import declaration has certain specifiers, and the specifiers are actually the, the, the nodes or the things that we're importing from that path. In this case, we have a single import um, called search bar. And we also have a source inside the import declaration. The source is of type literal, and the value of the source is UI search bar. So basically, the parser takes your text source code and generates a data structure that is a tree and contains the different nodes inside your uh, source. After that, ESLIN passes the AST to your rules. The rules analyze the AST and they can generate a report that contains errors in your code and different ways to fix that code. The cool thing about ESLint is that it is highly customizable. So you can actually write your own custom rules, and this is what we're going to be doing. And of course, these custom rules can generate custom errors and fixes. Also, you can provide a custom parser, and this is why we are actually able to use um, TypeScript and ESLint together. There's this awesome community project called TypeScript ESLint, and it contains a parser and set of rules for TypeScript that you can use together with ESLint. All right, let's actually go ahead and write a simple rule. I'm going to be using a website, a tool that is called um, AST Explorer. The cool thing about AST Explorer, first, it works offline because I'm not connected and I can still use it, which is nice. And the other cool thing is that uh, I can actually see the AST generated for my uh, source code. First of all, make sure that you are transpiling uh, using JavaScript and make sure you select the right parser. And in this case, we're using the TypeScript ESLint parser. So we have the source code code on the left, and on the right, we have the generated uh, AST. The root node is called program, and the body of this program has several import declarations, something called a TS import equals declaration, which means that this Node is actually specific, specific to TypeScript and several TypeScript uh, variable declarations. As you can see, when I highlight uh, the nodes here, they are also highlighted in the source code. And if I go ahead and select something in the source code, it's also going to be highlighted in the AST on the right. So once again, here, we're just going to focus on the first, um, the first node. We have an import declaration. The import declaration has a source, and the source is of type literal, and actually the value of the source is UI search bar. So by using the AST tree, uh, the AST explorer, we can al analyze the tree and write our rule so that we actually know what nodes uh, we're looking for. How do we write the rule? So first, it's pretty cool to write some tests for it. Um, the tests that we're going to use are very simple for the beginning. We have a few valid cases. Uh, this is a valid case. Again, when we're assigning something to a variable, it's also a valid case because it's not an actual import. A console walk with some text is also a valid case. And then we have some invalid cases. So. Uh, if we have an import from UI search bar, we want to get a fix, and the fixed text should look like that. It should be prefixed with TNS core modules slash. 
And it should also work for single quotes. So this is something that would have been very complicated or uh, a bit complicated to do if you're using regular expressions. All right, we have our tests. We can try to run them in watch mode. I'm using Jest in this repository. You can see it afterwards. Of course, tests fail, which is expected. And then we can go ahead and implement the rule. The ESLint rule has a very, very simple API. It is just an object. And this object has a certain name, some metadata about it, uh, like description, category, and stuff like that. And the thing that we're actually interested in that, sorry, is the create function. So the create function returns an object, and in this object, we can specify nodes that we're going to be uh, visiting. Or more likely, we can specify um, an import declaration and then provide a callback which contains the node. And this callback will be called when the parser goes through the AST and finds an import declaration. All right, what happens here? We can see if the node source matches some of our disallowed paths and then we need to report the problem. So basically I have the, all the disallowed paths here. Uh, we can create a utility function called is disallowed. We need to provide a path. And if our disallowed paths contain this path, we can return true. Or we can just return the statement. All good. As we saw, the import uh, specifier is actually in node.source. So if dot node.source is a disallowed path, we want to report a problem. Also, it's pretty important to actually get the value of this. Uh, as you can see here, we have the source, which is a node, and we have the value inside value. So how do we report problems? By using the context object. We need to specify the node that has some problem, and then we need to specify a message. And I just have the message here. That's pretty much about it. What did they do wrong? Is this allowed? Yeah. Thank you. Includes. I guess I make some. Last one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. OK, we get an error, but the error now is that yeah, we actually have an error that is reported, but we are not getting the fixed outputs right. So in, we need to provide a fixer. How do we do that? In the report, um, the fixer is actually a function, and it accepts the, um, the node. Now it's actually a function which accepts a fixer, and then it should return the fixed node. So we need to use the replace text function on the fixer, provide the node that should be fixed, and provide the new value. OK. So the node that we want to be fixing is actually the node.source. And what is the fixed value? Well, we can just grab the value from here. Um, 
the value from the node source and fix it, right? Which means that we can prepend um, our prefix and then keep the original value. Sounds about right, but our tests fail again. Why is that? Because we actually lose the, um, the quotes. If you go to the AST Explorer again, we're gonna notice that in the value we have just the value of the, of the source. We don't have the quotes that we're using. But there is also a row value on the node and we can use that so that we can preserve the, uh, the quotes that we have. So fixed, the fixed row value will be, um, okay, we can get the row from here. And we can replace just the value with the fixed value. And then provide a fixed row thing. Now our tests pass. Cool. Um, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We do have a bunch of non-implemented tests commented out but we're not gonna focus on all of them. Um, maybe we can just fix this one because it's a little bit more interesting. So we have this syntax here, import search bar module require something. We can see now that this test is failing because we're not covering it. And let's go to the AST Explorer again. Uh, this is the wine here, or was it here? No, it's this wine over here. The name of the node is called TS import equals declaration. And actually the require over here is a module reference of type TS external module reference. So basically we have to do the same thing and catch the expression here and see if it is valid or not. Let's try to implement that as well. So what we need to do is provide, okay, let's just grab this thing here. Uh, we need to specify the name of the node that we want the node type and just write pretty much the same function. I'm not going to implement this whole thing, but you get the idea. Uh, then to make the same thing um, work for the require statement, we can expect that require is actually um, a call expression because it's not some kind of uh, syntax that is embedded in um, JavaScript, it is part of the CommonJS specification. And the require has a callee called require and has some certain arguments, so we have to compare them again. That's pretty much how you write the whole rule. Okay, cool. And something else, if you're not sure about the types of the nodes, uh, visit the ES3 specification. It contains information about um, ES5 up to ES2020 and basically says how a JavaScript parser should parse and call these node types. Okay, how do we distribute the rule? One way to do it is by using KSLint plugins. They are just NPN modules which pack some additional rules that we can use inside our project. Something important about the plugin is that it has to have this name format, ESLint plugin dash plugin name and it can also be scoped. So in our case, uh, we can call the plugin ESLint plugin native script or at native script ESLint plugin. We'll go with the first approach. The other thing that we need to do is just export uh, an object which has, uh, contains all our rules from that plugin. And how do we use the plugin inside the Angular or TypeScript project? We need to install some things. So first of all, obviously we need to install the plugin, then we need to install ESLint, and then we also need the TypeScript ESLint parser. The second part of the equation is to add the ESLint configuration file. Um, the name of this file is ESLint RC. So we need to specify the parser that we are using. Again, the TypeScript ESLint parser. We need to specify that the source type is a module so that we can use import and export syntax. 
we also uh, have to specify the plugin that we're using. So the plugin was called ESLint plugin native script, but in the configuration file, it should be called just native script because it's some kind of ESLint specific thing. And then we can uh, enlist all the rules that we're using. Uh, finally, how do we lint and fix? Well, by executing ESLint from the command line. Uh, let's try to do that. So I have this application here. It is a native script Angular application. And in the app component, I have this wrong import using the old syntax. So in order to fix it, I need to execute the ESLint, specify the extension of the files. Because by default, it is JavaScript. I need to specify TS or for TypeScript. Um, and I need to specify the source directory. So what I get here is an error that using short imports is not allowed. And also get a hint that they can use this rule with the fix option. So if I execute it again by providing dash dash fix, um, I'm going to fix the rule, uh, the import, sorry. That's pretty cool. And if you're using VS Code, you can also integrate it, uh, ESLint with it. In order to do that, you need to go to extensions, uh, find the ESLint extension. I don't have. Uh, network, but you can find the ESLint extension, install it, and the only other thing that you need to do is configure ESLint to work both for TypeScript and JavaScript. This is the configuration that you need to insert in your settings JSON. After that, you're going to be able to see errors. So if I break that again, I'm going to see the same error that I saw when I was using the command line. And you can also fix this problem. So it's pretty straightforward to use ESLint in Angular and TypeScript projects. Next, uh, how do we use this ESLint rule inside NG Update? Well, there's this tool called Schematics. It is a project transformations tool that can uh, scaffold, update, and execute tasks. Uh, it is something that the Angular CLI is using under the box a lot. And uh, it works with ng-generate, for example. So if you use ng-generate and create components, modules, and stuff like that, you're actually using um, schematics internally. Um, or the Angular CLI is using schematics. And the other cool thing about schematics is that you can write your own schematics and extend the functionalities of the Angular CLI with it. So if you create a collection containing schematics um, called My Collection and specify your own components inside it, you can use it from the Angular CLI. ng-add, another command, also uses schematics under the hood. So you can make your uh, plugins ng-addable and provide installation schematics inside it. And what is important for us today is that ng-update also uses schematics under the, the hood. So in order to um, make your library ng-updatable, you need to write your own schematic collection, which basically contains um, migration scripts. So how do you do that? The first thing is that you need to go to your library in the package JSON and specify the ng-update key. The ng-update key has, um, the important thing about it is it has a key called migrations, which points to a migration JSON file. The migration JSON file is a JSON schema, which uh, contains a description of your migration scripts. So um, the key doesn't really matter. We have a single migration script here called migration v002 and so on. Uh, the important thing is that it's going to migrate to version 2. So if, you're, um, if your project is on version 001 or 000 and execute ng update demo lib, it is going to execute this migration script. Uh, it also, you can specify some description. You have a schema key, which uh, specifies the options for this migration. We're going to see that. And the most important thing is that you have a factory. So what is this factory thing? The factory contains the actual schematic that you have to write. So we have some function that returns another function. This is kind of weird, right? So 
Let's see some schematics theory here. The most important object in the schematics library is called a tree. So the tree contains a base, which is a representation of the project that you're executing the command in. And it also contains actions. These actions are the actual modifications that will be applied to the file system. A rule is a function which takes a tree and returns another tree. The idea is that you can add different actions to the tree that uh, then the schematics library will apply to the file system. A rule factory is a function which returns a rule, which essentially means that it is a function which returns another function. So if you go back to the example, the inner function here is the rule, and the outer function is the rule factory. All right, how do we provide options to a schematic? As we saw, we have a schema key inside the migration JSON file, and this points to another schema JSON file. The important thing about it is the properties um, object which contains the different options that we can provide to our schematic. And in this case, we have actually the project option, which is inserted by default by the Angular COI. It's quite important. You don't have to specify it manually. The Angular COI will figure out which is the project that you're executing uh, this ng update or ng add or ng generate in. So we can use the project name. Uh, the options argument is inserted in the outer function, and we can access it from the actual row, from the inner function. Cool, a few basic things about schematics before uh, writing the actual migration schematic. Um, we can read files by using tree.read and specifying the path to the file, and this actually returns a buffer, and in order to convert convert the buffer to something usable, we need to use buffer.toString. We can read directories by using tree.get directory, and uh, the object that we get back has a visit uh, function, and we can specify a callback, which will be called for every single path that is contained inside the source directory. Finally, we can edit files by using tree.override, specifying the, file, uh, the path to the file, and specifying the new content. All right, so the schematic that we are going to write needs to do the following things. First, it's got to find the, the source directory of the project that we're um, executing it in so that we don't apply it, uh, the ESLint rule by mistake to node modules or something like that. Then it needs to read all TypeScript and JavaScript files uh, so that we don't try to apply the ESLint rule to HTML or CSS or something like that. Finally, it needs to apply the ESLint rule to their content and it needs to overwrite the files with the fixed content. How do we find the source directory? So there's this file you may be familiar with called AngularJSON, which contains information about our workspace. Um, in order to get the project, we can use the project name that we got from the Angular COI, and this will give us the project settings. Um, it also contains information about the source root. So in this particular case, it will be our project, the name of the project, dash source, or something like that. So this is the right way to figure out which is the source directory in an Angular project. After that, uh, we need to figure out how to get only the TypeScript and JavaScript files. Here we have a hazelout extension function, which just uh, filters out um, files that end with TS and JS. Then we get uh, the directory for the, for the source directory. And then we visit every single path and add every uh, JavaScript and TypeScript file to some set. And then we ret return the set. Quite simple. Uh, then we need to apply the ESLint rule. The cool thing about ESLint is it also has a node API that we can use. So we import the linter. Uh, we import the rules from our plugin, and we also get uh, the parser. So we create a new linter, specify the rule by using define rule, specify the parser with defi define parser, and then we can use the veri verify and fix function. We apply verify and fix to the content of the file, and we specify the rules 
pretty much uh, in the way that our ESLint RC file looked like. And then we can get the fixed content from the uh, messages.output. How do we rewrite the files? Well, we can just um, apply this ESLint function to every single file that we get, and then use tree.overwrite. It's quite simple. And tree.overwrite registers another action that schematics will execute on the file system and override the file. And if we execute that, ng update thing on an um, application, first we're going to get um, information about uh, the package JSON. We're going to install the latest version of the package. And after the installation finishes, we're also going to update the app component TS file. So if we see the difference, uh, again, the import is fixed. And pretty much that's what you need to do. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>